there are docks in Salford. There are bleaching works, dye works and cotton mills. 172,000 people live in the city. 132,000 are men and women of working age. There are 22,000 people of pensionable age. And 40,000 children, children who can never know when spring comes. There are no trees and no flowers on Primrose Hill. I came back to see what changes there were in Hanky Park, where Love on the Dole was written 22 years ago, a district that gets its name from Hankinson Street. Very little seemed to have changed. I found the same grim backs and the same drab fronts. The same houses, but 20 years older and that much worse. Many of them were condemned years ago, but they're still lived in. The housewives still keep up the old tradition of brownstoning the front steps. And you can still buy a hot cooked meal at the shop around the corner. There are still interiors like this. All the same, there is evidence of more money to spend and more things to spend it on. But you can't wash away grime with money. Grime that rises from a thousand chimneys and falls on Salford a thousand tons of it every year. What happens to people's health in these surroundings? Before the health service, this was an area of the sixpenny doctor. You paid sixpence a week to go on a doctor's list. Now everyone is on a doctor's list. What has this change meant? All right, there we are. There's your prescription. Now, mind what you're doing, won't you? Yes, thank you, Doctor. And I'll see you again in a I second. asked the doctor, who was carrying on the practice his father had before him. Now, uh, that chap's not too bad for 77. The reason being that he gets regular injections for pernicious anemia, which is quite a serious disease if it isn't properly treated. Before the health service, my father, who was here for 40 years before me, must have known many cases of this and other diseases which weren't adequately treated because the patients thought they ought to pay as a fee. We never insisted on this, and of course they could have gone to the hospital, I suppose. But nevertheless, many people didn't like the idea, and consequently they didn't attend regularly and went about in a chronic state of ill health. Now, I think this removal of any financial barrier between the patient and the doctor is undoubtedly the biggest single virtue of the National Health Service. There are snags, of course, to this service. Many people, many more people than before, now come to these surges, and we do frequently get very full surges with 25, 30 or more patients in. They seem to look upon the visit to the doctor as part of the shopping call in here between going to the butchers and the grocers. And what's more, they demand things from me rather than asking for an opinion, which is my job. They're in a very small minority, but nevertheless they cause a disproportionate amount of trouble. In spite of these difficulties, I think the general practitioner can now do very much more for his patient than he did before. Many doctors are pleased that people can visit them more freely. They say they can discover disease at an early stage but it often means a long wait just to get a prescription. And the prescription has to be made up. Every year, more than 200 million prescriptions are dispensed in Britain, and not all of them by doctors. Recently, many of my customers have asked me to prescribe for them for their minor ailments. This I have done, and they are quite happy to have me both prescribe and dispense a bottle there and then, and they express the point of view that it's mainly because of the time of waiting in the surgery. Men in particular have made this point, and they are rather afraid of losing some of their wage by the time spent in surgeries. Some people are too ill or too infirm to be able to attend the doctor. 
And for them, there is another service, the district nurse who looks after them in their own home. In weather like this, her hands are very full, particularly with cases of bronchitis among old people. Here in Salford, smoke and fog are a real danger to health. Recent medical research suggests that the smoky atmosphere of our cities may be one cause of lung cancer. Last year, a hundred people died from lung cancer in Salford. Mr. Kennedy is being treated for bronchitis made acute by a recent heavy fog. This sort of atmosphere doesn't help the tubercular patient either, and the number of people who get TB is decreasing too slowly. With modern hospital treatment, they can be cured. But in the country as a whole, there is a shortage of beds for hospital treatment, partly because we have not enough hospitals, but also because many of those we have are inadequate. Is it possible to carry on modern treatment in a hospital like this, where to reach the operating theater, a serious case may have to be wheeled across a bridge in hail or in snow. Cramped for space in the sterilizing room. Preparing meals in old fashioned kitchens. All this is making the work of the hospital staff more difficult. No wonder that wards have to be closed because of a shortage of nurses. Let us hear the matron of a large hospital. We have a large number of nurses in this hospital. I have 300, but I am about 60 short at the present moment. These are very grave shortages. And sometimes I just wonder how we're going to improve things or what we can do. Sometimes I think that the reason why we have our difficulties is because girls who leave school between the ages of 15 and 16 must do something towards filling in their time before they're able to commence their training at 18. And very often, in spite of the fact that they long to be nurses, they do other things and then perhaps lose interest or lose the urge to come into hospital. Uh, we have quite good cadet schemes coming into operation, and there's no doubt about it that these are helpful, but they're not enough. Conditions are vastly improved nowadays, but the nurses that we have here are far too overworked, and therefore they have very little time for their studies, become overtired, and also become disheartened. The shortage of nurses is making it harder for those who have stuck to the job. But the shortage may not be due entirely to unattractive wages and hard working conditions. Nursing has always been a vocation which calls for great personal devotion to the sick. Is there a danger that the sense of vocation may be watered down by a system under which the sick person could become a number on a register, one of the queue? Take out patients, for example. How often have you had to wait for hours on a hard bench in a drafty corridor? In Salford, the outpatients departments have been organized to avoid this waiting time. Patients are called to see the specialist by appointment. 